What's going on smart people? Today I'm going to be talking about a very special system of units known as natural units. Now there's different kinds of natural units with different names, but it all amounts to the same thing. We have a set of physical quantities that we want to set equal to one. How do we do it? Uh, for us, we're going to be interested in setting the speed of light equal to the reduced Planck's constant equal to Boltzmann's constant equal to 1. We'll focus on Boltzmann's constant very minimally. It's really just to show the consequence of doing it. Um, in different versions of natural units with the different names, you may set Newton's gravitational constant equal to 1 or the mass of the proton. The point of the video isn't to say, look at all of these things we can set equal to 1. It's to say why we can do it in the first place and what it means. So let's go ahead and start off with the speed of light. We're going to lay out a bit of a procedure. Uh, the literature on the motivation for doing it is a there's a range. There's a range of explanations and I think the careful explanation is somewhere in between and that's how we're going to be following in this video. So I want to set the C, I want to set the C, I want to set the speed of light equal to one. How do I do it? Well the first step, first, is to redefine the unit. Define the unit. And I'm going to make some comments on this after we actually go through this. Um, the speed of light is roughly 300 million meters per second, but what if we don't use meters per second? What if we use schmeckles per second or meters per super second or whatever? I don't care what you call it. If I use a different system of units, then it, we can choose a system of units where it's one of that unit. So a consequence of doing this would be that C is one of that unit. In the literature, some people will just stop here. Some people will say it's one of that unit. If it's one, why include it in all of our equations? Let's just drop it and in the back of our mind, we'll make a mental note that at the end of the problem, we have to do some dimensional analysis to see where those factors of C went. That's fine in practice as long as you know what you're doing, but at those intermediate stages you will be setting things equal that have different units, which can be very confusing for someone who's not familiar with natural units, which is why we're going to be a bit more careful. So in practice this is fine. This is usually not the conventional way of doing it, but it is a method that I've seen. It's just redefine the unit, C equal to one of that unit, which is probably the more intuitive version or intuitive way of, of normalizing it. Okay, the second thing is it's one of that unit. Uh, so second is to redefine the quantity, the physical quantity. And I think that this is the more common thing to do, but it still has a bit, a little hint of sloppiness in it, I think. So if I consider, say, the uh, invariant space-time interval in special relativity, delta S squared is equal to C, delta t squared minus delta x squared minus delta y squared oops, minus delta z squared. Uh, special relativity says that space and time should be on equal footing, so why not insist that they also have the same units? So I could say I want to impose, and I'm going to use this notation throughout the video, impose that time has the same units, that's what the square bracket means, the units of time has the same units as uh, distance, I'll call that L. Then if we look at this equation, we have if time and space have the same units, then the constant that multiplies time has to be a dimensionless quantity. So imposing that these things, redefining our quantities, will make C or another constant if we follow it for maybe h bar or something becomes dimensionless. Because if these, if it wasn't dimensionless, then we would be subtracting things that had different units and that wouldn't make any sense. Uh, so this is, this is a common thing to do and then they'll choose the value of C equal to one. And this is where I say it's a bit sloppy in this respect as well, because once you have a dimensionless quantity, I don't think, I think that you lose the freedom to change its value. You can't change the value of the fine structure constant, which is a dimensionless quantity. You can't change the value of pi. So C can't, I don't think can be redefined once you've made it dimensionless. I think that the, the proper procedure is a combination of both of these, where first we redefine the unit such that C is one of that unit, and then we shift the units onto the different variable. We redefine the physical quantity. Now you may say, Andrew, why are, <laughs> that's, 
That's pretty bizarre though. This is more intuitive. Now to say that time and space have the same units, that's kind of crazy. But it's really not as foreign a concept as you may think. If I were to ask you how far is the mall and you were to tell me it's 10 miles away or it's 15 minutes away, you're giving me different units but no information is lost. This is just an analogy but I'm just trying to point out that it's not as novel an idea or concept as, uh, as you may initially think. But why go through the trouble of doing this in the first place? So this is the procedure for doing the natural units, but why do we want to do it? It makes the equation simpler. So let's, let's see how. So in these natural units, we have C normalized to one and it's dimensionless, so we can just drop it from the invariant space-time interval equation. And we can also do that for something like Einstein's energy relation. E squared is equal to PC squared plus uh, MC squared squared. If c is equal to 1, then this is just equal to the square of the momentum plus the square of the mass. And what that tells us is that in these natural units, energy has units of momentum, which has units of mass. Typically in things like nuclear and particle physics, the unit of energy that we like to use is the electron volt. So 1 eV is approximately equal to, I think, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So it's a small amount of energy, but you also have very small particles. So we can express all three of these physical quantities directly in terms of the electron volt. Is there a way that we can do that with the time and space? And the answer to that is yes, we just have to fix yet another quantity. So we have an energy here, we have a time or a space here. What physical quantity is in terms of both either energy and time or energy and space? H-bar is perfect. H-bar, the units of H-bar is energy times time, which since time and space have the same units and natural units, this is also equal to uh, energy times a length. So if we impose, if we first normalize H-bar and then we ship, want to make it dimensionless, then as a consequence, we get that the units of energy are equal to, well, the units of one over time, which is equal to one over length, has units of one over length. These will be inverses of each other. And just like the, the time and space analogy, if we have energy and time, well, if you have a particle with a very high frequency, like a very high frequency uh, photon, that corresponds to a very high energy. How is frequency related to the period? Well, if I have a higher frequency, that corresponds to a lower period. So this kind of inverse relationship also isn't so crazy to think about. But this isn't just hand wavy. This is saying like if I have higher energy, I can probe smaller distances. So why do accelerators have these particles accelerating at such high energies? So I can probe interactions at smaller scales. Now. I refuse to ever learn what the value of h-bar is because if I have to use electron volts or joules or joule seconds, that's just, it's something times 10 to the negative a lot. That's all I can tell you. However, one trick that my high energy physics professor taught us was that h-bar times the speed of light is actually a pretty easy one to remember. It's about 197 mega electron volts, so that's 10 to the 6 electron volts times a Fermi, and a Fermi is 10 to the minus 15 meters. So what this tells us is that if I have one inverse, so one uh, MeV inverse, that corresponds to a size scale of about 197 Fermis, so times 10 to the minus 15 meters. So one MeV can correspond to about a size scale of about 10 to the minus 13 meters. So this isn't, yes, though we're redefining our physical quantities, this isn't just hand wavy, there's still some tangibility to it all, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> okay, the last thing is, I'm barely gonna touch on it because I don't really have an analogy, to be honest, with doing the same thing with Boltzmann's constant. You just get the idea by now that you normalize it and then you shift the units over. So Boltzmann's constant, Kb, is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, and it's in terms of the permittivity of free space. So to normalize it, you insist that uh, maybe epsilon 0 is equal to 1 over 4 pi, and then this is 1, and then you shift the units. There are also systems of units where you make, where you normalize epsilon 0. So you take this to be the, the uh, equal to 1 in dimensionless, but 
Well, why, why am I talking about this at all? Well, the next question is, is we were able to relate energy, momentum, mass, time, and space all in terms of the electron volt. The last quantity that I'm kind of interested in is how does shifting to these natural units affect the units of the electric charge? What is the natural unit of the electric charge under these assumed dimensionless quantities? So assuming Kb is also equal to one. Well, one way of doing it is to relate it to another dimensionless quantity that maybe you've heard about known as the fine structure constant, alpha. Alpha characterizes the strength of the electromagnetic interaction between charged particles. And it is equal to the square of the charge of the electron divided by Boltzmann's constant times h bar times the speed of light. Now what's really cool about this is the fine structure constant is a dimensionless quantity. And now we've chosen units such that Boltzmann's constant, h bar, and c are also dimensionless. Now there's no way of taking something with units and dividing it by something that's dimensionless and ending up with something that's dimensionless. So what that tells us is that E, the charge of the electron, is dimensionless in natural units. So alpha is just equal to E squared, which is equal to approximately equal to 1 over 137. Now what makes this pretty cool is that in things like quantum field theory, if you want to solve a problem where you flip on the electromagnetic interaction, you can't solve it exactly, you have to use perturbation theory. And perturbation theory means that I have an easier problem plus a series of correcting terms that are weighted by some constant, some coupling constant, and hopefully the more terms that you include, the later terms contribute less and less to, to the real solution. So we can use things like the charge of the electron in quantum electrodynamics as a coupling constant as it's a dimensionless quantity, which is pretty nice. If we didn't, then we might use things like the fine structure constant instead. But yeah, that's gonna do it for, the, for natural systems of units. Um, this is the exact same procedure if I wanna do the thing with a gravitational constant. But one thing that was important is that when I fixed these three quantities, I lost the freedom to choose what the value of the electric charge was. It told me that it had to be dimensionless, but it also told me what the value had to be. I wasn't able to say, let's also make this one because the fine structure constant is already one over 137 a bit, which is why I say that it's a bit sloppy to make something dimensionless and then insist that it take on a different value. I don't think that that's a fair thing to try to do. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope it was a little bit helpful and shed some light on the whole matter. Let me know in the comment section if it was, and I'll see you guys there.